Okay, here we go. So uh, next we have Josh Kloon telling us about Keller's conjecture. conjecture. Uh, all right. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, so yeah, so... Uh, yeah, I'm good. Okay, all right. Uh, so yeah, thanks. Uh, so I'll be talking about a formalized reduction of Keller's conjecture. Uh, so to start, I should clarify what Keller's conjecture actually is. Uh, suppose you have an arbitrary d-dimensional Euclidean space. What we want to do is we want to cover the space in unit cubes such that all cubes are axis aligned, all cubes have the same size, every point in the space is in exactly one cube, and no two cubes share a face. If we have a set of cubes that satisfies the first three properties, what we have is called a tiling. And if we have a set of cubes that satisfies all four properties, what we have is called a face share free tiling. And Keller's conjecture stipulates that face share free tilings don't exist. Uh, so to gain an intuition as to why this might be true, let's take a look at the two dimensional case. Uh, if we want to build a face share free tiling, we have to start by putting a cube somewhere and in two dimensions, that's just a square. Uh, as a convention, we're going to say that the left and bottom edges of the square are included as part of the square, whereas the top and right edges are not. Uh, this is just so that if we have two squares that are right next to each other uh, and we're considering a point that's on the boundary, uh, there's no ambiguity as to which square that point belongs to. So we start with this square here, and if we want to cover every point in the space, we have to cover, uh, for instance, this red point. Uh, we might try to put a square here, but then we'll uh, be exhibiting face sharing, so we maybe move the square a bit. But then we're going to find that we're stuck, and we can't actually proceed any further to produce a face share free tiling. The reason for that is if we want to cover this green point without any gaps or intersections, the only way we're going to be able to do that is to put an additional square and nestle it into the corner of the two squares that we already have. But if we do that, then the square that we put down will be face sharing with the square on the right, violating our face share free condition. And so, uh, uh, and so from this, we can see that it's not possible to produce a face share free tiling in two dimensions. And the situation is very similar in three dimensions. If you start uh, putting down cubes to try to build a face share free tiling, you'll quickly find that there are some points that you can't cover without uh, sharing a face. So on screen, in order to cover any of the red points, uh, you have to place a cube in such a way that they'll be face sharing with one of the blue faces. So Keller's conjecture is true in two dimensions, and it's true in three dimensions, as we saw. Uh, so it's natural to think, well, if it's true for the small numbers, it probably by some inductive argument, it's just true in general. Uh, but unfortunately, the situation turns out to be a, a bit weirder than that. Uh, as it turns out, uh, Keller's conjecture is uh, true up to and including seven dimensions, and then is false in eight dimensions and higher, uh, which is just kind of a ridiculous result. Uh, it's uh, very counterintuitive, particularly because we can't natively reason about seven-dimensional or eight-dimensional space. So uh, how do we approach this problem? How have people uh, come to these conclusions? How do we establish these facts about uh, the dimensions in which Keller's conjecture is true. Uh, the primary, uh, like the critical move that's been made uh, historically to tackle this problem has been a reduction from the original uh, infinite geometric problem that I described to a finite uh, graph theoretic problem. Specifically, the reduction says that if Keller's conjecture is true in d dimensions, then a clique of size 2 to the d does not exist in a certain Keller graph. And if Keller's conjecture is false in d dimensions, then a clique of size 2 to the d does exist in a certain Keller graph. And this is the uh, main reduction that I formalized. Uh, I did the formalization in Lean 3. There were some things in Lean 3 that were particularly helpful for that. In particular, access to MathLib and some linear arithmetic tactics were, uh, they, they became very useful. But uh, fundamentally, there was nothing about this formalization that needed to be done in Lean 3. And I would expect that if this formalization were to be done in a different theorem prover, uh, it would look largely similar. Uh, the main bulk of the work was in taking some very intuitive and visual geometric arguments and figuring out how to formalize them precisely. Uh, as the last speaker mentioned, uh, geometric arguments can be particularly difficult to formalize. Great. Uh, so to start, uh, let's just define the necessary concepts, figure out how to actually formalize the statement of Keller's conjecture. Uh, I'm going to represent uh, d-dimensional points as d-length vectors of reals, uh, basically the thing you would expect. Uh, then I'm going to uh, write down this in-cube predicate that indicates whether a point is in a cube. I'm going to indicate cubes by their bottommost corner. So for this uh, cube on the right, it's defined by... Uh, oops, uh, hopefully I'm... Sorry for the mic problems. Um, the... Uh, so this cube on the right is defined by this uh, red point in the corner. Um, and uh, the cube extends one unit out in each positive direction. 
So the, um, uh, this uh, green point is in uh, the cube defined by this uh, red corner. If uh, for each coordinate of the uh, green point, uh, there is, uh, it's between zero and one greater than the corresponding coordinate of the red point. Uh, from this, I can define what a cube is. Uh, it's simply the set of points that are contained in a cube defining corner. Um, then uh, uh, for, uh, I can define what a tiling is, uh, which is simply a set of uh, either cubes or interchangeably cube defining corners, such that for every point in the d-dimensional space, uh, there exists a unique cube in the tiling that contains that point. Uh, then I can say what it means for two cubes to be face sharing. We say that two cubes are face sharing if they if their cube defining corners agree on all coordinates except for one where they differ by exactly one unit. So for these two squares on the right, uh, they're face sharing because they completely because their cube defining corners uh, completely agree on the x-axis and they differ by exactly one on the y-axis. Uh, and then I can say that a tiling is face share free if for any two cubes in the tiling, uh, those two cubes are not face sharing. Uh, and with these definitions, I can actually uh, finally write down what Keller's conjecture says. Uh, for any set of uh, cube defining corners, if that set of cube defining corners uh, defines a tiling, then it does not define a face share free tiling. And with this, I can write down the two main results of my formalization, that if there is a clique of size 2 to the d in a particular Keller graph, then Keller's conjecture is false in d dimensions. And if there is not a clique of size 2 to the d in a particular Keller graph, then Keller's conjecture is true in d dimensions. Uh, and I'll get to uh, exactly what I mean by a particular Keller graph in just a little bit. Um, so uh, the first thing we want to do is we want to simplify the problem so that rather than dealing with these kind of unwieldy, arbitrary sets of points, we want to impose a bit more structure to the sorts of tilings that we're considering. So I'm going to uh, do a, a reduction from the original version of uh, Keller's conjecture to a periodic version of Keller's conjecture that only considers periodic tilings. Uh, so what is a periodic tiling? If I have a, uh, a tiling here, and I consider the set of what I'm going to call the core points, these are all the points that, uh, whose coordinates are either 0 or 1. Uh, and I look at the cubes in the tiling that contain these core points. Uh, what I can say is that the tiling itself is periodic uh, if every cube in the tiling is an even integer translation of one of the core cubes. Uh, and so we can uh, basically like assign colors to all the cubes in the tiling, and we're going to have finitely many colors. Uh, this is, uh, uh, there's nothing wrong with this definition. It's pretty easy to write down. But something that's a little bit odd about this definition is how it very explicitly privileges the origin. We're defining what it means for the whole tiling to be periodic with reference to specifically the cubes that are nearby the origin, which is a bit of an odd property. Uh, and so uh, it turns out that it's actually very helpful for us to have an additional uh, definition of what it means to be periodic that does not privilege the origin in this way and just refers to cubes in the tiling being even integer translates of each other. Uh, one of the uh, interesting tidbits that came about from doing this formalization was the fact that it was really helpful to independently have both of these definitions and just prove them equivalent. Uh, because there are some places where it's very useful to have the first definition so that we can place some cues near the, or near the origin and then build a periodic tiling about it. And there are some places where it's very useful to have the second definition uh, so that if we're considering like an arbitrary cube in a, a periodic tiling and we care about a nearby cube, uh, we can get those properties without caring where we are with respect to the origin. So that's our notion of periodic tilings. And the thing we want to do is we want to show that if Keller's conjecture is false, which is to say there is a face share free tiling in D dimensions, then there must also be a face share free periodic tiling in D dimensions. And then this will allow us to kind of restrict the problem we're considering from arbitrary tilings to just periodic tilings, which have quite a bit more structure uh, with us to work with. So the kind of high level outline of this proof is we start with uh, an arbitrary face share free tiling, which might not be periodic. Then we take a look at the core points and we zoom in on the cubes that contain those core points. Then we use these cubes as a basis to build a periodic tiling uh, around it. And the things we need to prove about this new set of core, uh, this new set of cubes is that it's periodic, that it's face share free, and that it's a tiling. Uh, the fact that it's periodic uh, we can show very easily, particularly with our first uh, kind of definition of periodic because we basically made it periodic by construction. Uh, to show that it's face share free, what we can observe is that if there's any face sharing in this uh, diagram, then it has to be between cubes of different colors. 
And if there is, there's uh, going to be face sharing between those two colors everywhere they appear, including in our original uh, set of points, uh, in our original set of cubes. But since these uh, original four cubes came from our face share free tiling, there can't be any face sharing there. And therefore, there can't be any face sharing everywhere. And then finally, to show that this is uh, indeed a tiling, which is to say every point in the space is covered by exactly one cube, uh, I can do, uh, we can do an inductive argument where we start by examining this purple square. Uh, we know that every point in this purple square is covered by exactly one cube uh, because our original uh, set of cubes was a tiling. And then we can use uh, some geometric arguments slash some properties of how we uh, constructed uh, this periodic tiling to extend that argument to say if everything in the uh, first purple cube was covered by exactly one uh, cube, then everything in the adjacent purple square also has to be covered by exactly one square. And then we can iterate this argument to show that kind of for any point in the space, uh, it has to be the case that uh, that point has to be covered by exactly one cube. Great. Uh, so we've uh, simplified the original version of Keller's conjecture to the periodic version of Keller's conjecture, and this simplifies our problem quite a bit. Uh, but we're still dealing with an infinite geometric problem uh, when what we want to do is we want to discretize to a finite graph theoretic problem so we can apply uh, some combinatorial techniques to it. Um, so to do this, uh, we're going to have to introduce the Keller graphs. Uh, the Keller graphs are a family of graphs based on two parameters, D and S. Uh, D corresponds to the number of dimensions we're in, and S is a bit more complicated to explain, uh, but the basic idea is that it corresponds to the number of distinct coordinates mod 2 uh, at which a cube can appear along any axis. Uh, the important thing about S is that for periodic tilings in particular, we can, uh, like, uh, we can put a very exact bound on S because in a periodic tiling, our cubes are even integer translates of each other, and so uh, they're going to be, their coordinates are going to be equal to each other mod 2. Uh, and so this will let us uh, bound S. Um, so those are kind of what the parameters say. And then if we're considering a particular Keller graph, GDS, uh, the definition of the graph is as follows. Uh, all vertices are D-length vectors where each element is, in, is from 0 to 2, to S, 2 times S minus 1. And then two uh, vectors or vertices, V1 and V2, are adjacent if and only if they differ in at least two coordinates. And in at least one coordinate, they differ by exactly S. The differing in at least two coordinates is going to uh, guarantee that there isn't face sharing. And the differing by exactly S is going to guarantee that there uh, isn't any gaps or intersections. And uh, kind of here I have the, the formal definitions, but they're pretty uh, straightforward to write down. I use a simple graph library, but there's not uh, from MathLib, but there isn't like a whole lot going on there. Uh, other provers have equivalent things. Um, so I've uh, explained or at least said at you kind of what the Keller graphs are, uh, but I haven't really given any intuition as to how this uh, relates to the periodic tilings that I was talking about a second ago. Uh, so to gain a sense about how that works and how the uh, question of uh, periodic phase share free tilings maps onto the question of cliques in these Keller graphs, uh, let's take a look at an, at an example. Here on the left, I have a uh, two-dimensional uh, periodic tiling. It's not face share free because there are no two-dimensional face share free tilings. And on the right, I have the Keller graph G22. Uh, so the, uh, the uh, D is set to two because we're in two dimensions and S is also set to two. The first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna relate uh, cubes in our periodic tiling to uh, vertices in our Keller graph. So if we look at uh, the red cube, uh, the red square there, uh, this red square has a cube defining corner at the origin, 0, 0. And so this is going to relate uh, to the vertex uh, 0, 0. Then if we look at uh, this green cube, uh, this uh, is uh, um, generated by the cube defining corner at 1 uh, and then uh, one, uh, 0 0.5, which is 2 over 2 and then 1 over 2. So this is going to correspond to the vertex 2, 1. Uh, adjacency in our uh, Keller graph is going to correspond to whether or not there is face sharing uh, between the two cubes uh, that we're considering. So since uh, uh, red and green do not share a complete edge, uh, they are adjacent in our Keller graph. Uh, for this uh, blue cube, this uh, has a cube defining corner at uh, 0, 1, which is 0 over 2, 2 over 2. So this is going to correspond to the vertex 0, 2. And uh, since blue and green do not share a complete face, they are going to be adjacent in our color graph. But since blue and red do share a complete face, they're not going to be adjacent in our color graph. And we can see that on the right. 
Uh, and then finally, uh, for this uh, black square, um, this is at uh, the coordinate uh, 1, 1 1.5, which is 2 over 2, 3 over 2. Uh, so this corresponds to the vertex 2, 3. And we can see that, indeed, it's connected to blue and red in the Keller graph because it doesn't share a face with blue or red. But it is not connected to green in the Keller graph because uh, black and green share a face. Uh, and so uh, these are uh, like kind of the main ideas for how properties of our periodic tilings map onto properties of our Keller graph. And then if we kind of reconsider the uh, actual statement we care about the Keller graph, it's a statement about the existence of a clique of size 2 to the d. Uh, if we're talking about a clique, we're talking about a set of vertices that are all uh, adjacent to each other which is uh, going to correspond to a bunch of cubes, none of which are face share free. And then the reason that uh, the clique has to be size 2 to the d is because uh, the set of uh, core points, the set of points that are, uh, whose coordinates are all 0 or 1, there's exactly 2 to the d of these. And so the statement about the existence of a clique of size 2 to the d in the Keller graph uh, basically maps, uh, in terms of the periodic tiling, it maps onto this claim that we can stick enough cubes near the origin to cover all the core points without having any face sharing. And if we can do that, we can serve, uh, use that as the basis for a periodic tiling, uh, and that'll give us a periodic face share free tiling if that exists. Um, so for the two-dimensional case, uh, there are no uh, face share free uh, two-dimensional tilings, and so in the Keller graph we see here, there are no uh, four cleats. Um, so then, uh, just some kind of final uh, concluding remarks. Uh, the, there are two ways to apply the reduction that I uh, formalized to Keller's original conjecture. Uh, in the one direction, uh, we can talk about using the reduction to verify the fact that Keller's conjecture is false in eight or more dimensions. Uh, for this result on, uh, on top, if we can verify the existence of a clique of size 2 to the d in uh, any Keller graph uh, with uh, the d coordinate set to 8, uh, then that'll give us uh, the fact that Keller's conjecture is false in eight, or, in eight dimensions. And fortunately, in 2002, uh, Mackey published a clique of size 2 to the 8 in G82. Uh, and so he, it's literally a paper where most of the paper is just writing down what the clique is. Uh, and so this is uh, enough to just verify by brute force. Uh, and so I did that, and uh, that yielded a uh, proof that uh, Keller's conjecture, that, that, that yielded a proof that there is a clique of the appropriate size in the right graph, and that gives us the, uh, a formal proof that Keller's conjecture is false in eight dimensions. Uh, and then the, and that's something that uh, I already did. But for future work, uh, there's still the other direction to tackle, uh, which is um, there's been a more recent development in uh, 2020, uh, Brick and Seek et al. Uh, used uh, some SAT solving techniques and symmetry, and symmetry breaking techniques to show that no clique of size 2 to the 7 exists in the relevant uh, Keller graphs for dimension 7. Uh, and because of that, uh, uh, if we can uh, like formally verify the arguments that they use there, we can plug that into this second result to show that well, because we're supplying a proof that no clique of size 2 to the 7 exists in the relevant Keller graph, that'll give us a proof that Keller's conjecture is true in seven dimensions. And so that's something that uh, kind of I'd like to do in the future. Uh, that's all I have. Uh, thank you very much. OK, do we have questions? Thanks for the talk. Maybe that's a naive question, but uh, I think the previous speaker hmm. has formalized um, the impossibility of dissecting a cube in lean as well. And uh, I, I see those are very different problems as such, but I think they, there are notions that could be shared between the two formalizations. And my question is, are they shared or could they be shared? Um, they are not shared, and perhaps the only reason for that is that I'm not familiar with the work you're referring to. So I, I can't speak on to, as to kind of to what extent there are uh, shared ideas that like could, in principle, uh, go together. Um, I'm not familiar with that work, unfortunately. Let me invite the final speaker of the session up to uh, plug in a laptop and uh, ask if there are any more questions for this talk. 
comment a little bit about the challenges that you faced in the formalization? I mean, it's kind of impressive. You started with the definition of a point. So like how much of the challenge is kind of on the, the sort of more basic development of the libraries and then versus the more advanced math? Yeah, there was um, definitely some kind of very like fundamental, uh, we have this fact that's extremely obvious and we just need to figure out how to formalize it. Uh, there's one lemma that we have that in most of the literature about Keller's conjecture, this lemma just doesn't appear. And in like the one place that I'm familiar with that it does appear, it's, uh, there are, I think, two sentences that justify it. Uh, but in our code, it took uh, like 1,500 lines to actually prove this fact. Uh, because the, the fact is, like, if you draw a picture, it's extremely obvious. The, the, uh, I guess briefly, it's, uh, if you draw a line through a tiling, uh, cubes have to appear one after another by exactly one unit. Otherwise, there'll be intersections or gaps. And that's extremely obvious, but uh, quite a pain to actually formally prove, as it turns out. Yeah, so two hands over here. I think we're only going to have time for one, so you guys can it out. So I have only one small question. Uh, how, uh, how many times to, it took to uh, brute force your, your conjecture at the, at the end? Uh, yeah, so this is, uh, this is a bit embarrassing. Um, the, uh, so the, the actual like, formalization proper, the stuff that like, was actually written by hand, this is about like, 10 to 15 uh, thousand lines of code. The brute force uh, proving that the uh, clique is actually a clique is half a million lines of lean code. Uh, there's definitely a better way to do it. Uh, and in fact, I know of a better way to do it, but uh, it's a lot easier to spend an afternoon like writing a script in Python to output half a million lines of lean code than to actually like do it properly. Okay, thank you. That's a great message to end on, so let's thank the speaker again.